So the talk that's going to be about cybersecurity is actually going to be about quite a bit more than cybersecurity. There's going to be a lot of information. I'm going to go kind of quick. And, uh, but nonetheless, the reason why I want to give uh, such a long and rapid-paced talk is that there's so much going on in our industry right now. And uh, the industry is really partnering together. And Cisco and Imagine are partnering together quite a bit to enable media going to the cloud. But what I've learned over the last uh, few days here at the show and just um, you know, over the last several years, there's a lot of misconceptions about how to get media production as well as distribution into the cloud. And there's, the misconception is that if it goes in the cloud, the magical cloud will solve all problems. And not only is it challenging to be able to accomplish this, the security aspects of it are very challenging. So I need to build up the story to get to the, to get to the point to talk about uh, cybersecurity. So this is the value chain of media that, that we're all very familiar with. And I just uh, almost want to say, hopefully say for the, almost the last IBC that the SDI to IP transition is happening or, and because it's happened. And it's in, in production now. It's in general availability, certainly in our equipment. And the conversion to IP, as well as the transition of, of taking in or acquiring content via SDI and then immediately getting it in IP frames um, is, is currently available. But we need to recognize, and just talking about security, that in each aspect of the value chain, a holistic approach to cybersecurity needs to be applied. So in uh, a talk that I gave at an IBC in an Imagine booth about a year ago, I used this slide. And I want to just reframe the, the topic again that of taking media, whether it's production or it's distribution, is using the concepts of software-defined networking and, and uh, function virtualization to the extreme. This industry is moving faster than any other. But just a quick recap, all of SDN is this one arrow here. And what I'm going to build up to in this talk is that, in fact, the network and virtual networking was, was a fundamental bottleneck for enabling media, both uh, production and, and distribution in the cloud. Uh, we've changed our portfolio, and the networking industry's changed its portfolio to be able to export telemetry into big data platforms and create a reactive uh, infrastructure that actually can handle computers, storage, network links, bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, coming and going. And this piece has been, uh, below this line, has been about seven years' worth of work and conversation in the networking and compute industry. But what's interesting for media professionals, I believe, is that all of the action is above that line and at the, at, at the application and PaaS layer. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. So big transitions, obviously, SDI to IP, the rise of enough x86 cycles, and then the enablement of cloud architectures with microservices. And again, there must be security across all of these elements. So I'm going to build up each, the, the rest of this talk um, on these three topics. Needless to say, I think we're all, all familiar with that the bit rates and data rates are rapidly rising on the different formats and encodings that are, that are being produced in media. This is a critical piece for taking media to the cloud because it requires capacity and resource planning at the network layer. A fundamental assumption <clears throat> of many cloud architectures is that the magical cloud is ubiquitous and infinite. Well, the internet is, in fact, ubiquitous. The problem is that bandwidth is not uh, infinite inside a data center for enterprise workloads. And just taking media workloads and saying, run them in the cloud, is not going to actually guarantee that the service is going to be built. But the good news is, is that media is very well groomed from a traffic perspective. And you know exactly what the bit rate is and how much load you're going to send across this data center and onto computers. As you, as you build this in uh, hypervisors and, micro, and, and containers, and all of these aspects can be orchestrated and are being orchestrated. So the real goal here is to replace large video routers in the center of this, it, that were in, was in the center of this picture, with an orchestrated stack of compute, storage, RAM, and networking that can, that can handle all of the resource planning necessary for everything uh, needed to produce and distribute content. So looking at a typical workflow, these, th sorry, this particular workflow has long been established in the industry and is now in production. I'm being able to use APIs at the orchestration layer and a media content 
production or distribution application on top of a controller architecture. And this is exactly how Imagine and Cisco have worked together. And so towards this end, not only are our media flows well groomed, but the features required are almost like a deterministic network inside that data center. And so understanding how to get the data in, moving around across the different workloads that compose that workflow is key, and then being able to recover from any faults uh, or changes. So a media data center, or as Cisco would call it, professional media networking, really the goal here is to have an open, flexible API at the top of the orchestration layer and PaaS layer that Imagine's used to plug in Xenium on top to, cre to create uh, the, the workflow that's necessary for, for media production. And what's interesting is that, and, and Ames is a big part of this, and uh, AMWOW is a big part of this, where the industry is to the point of maturity that those APIs are being standardized. And that's a critical piece and a big change over the last year that uh, we talked. So as we move forward, like I mentioned, <clears throat> a year ago when I was on this stage talking about this, this is what was necessary for me to even say hello to this community. I had to have minimally all of these features in place in IP data centers. And thankfully, um, these are all, all now have been uh, made generally available and in, uh, in production equipment. And so, Again, I'm moving rapidly through this because this is uh, hopefully familiar to everyone. But what becomes interesting and, and what we can show over in our booth just, uh, just maybe 50 meters away is in fact this fully orchestrated system from compute, storage, RAM, and networking to enable a professional media solution and looking at the end, utilizing our infrastructure uh, below that line such that the uh, applications on top necessary to, to produce media are actually functioning appropriately. We also announced and had a session uh, a couple days ago on this particular proof of concept with France Telecom where this has been put into production with a number of partners and can, can go beyond just the demonstration that in fact a, a couple media flows or static workflows can be created, but instead highly complex multi-partner uh, uh, environments can be brought together. And you see in, you know, a number of the partner symbols, Cisco and Imagine work deeply on this, along with uh, both mutual partners as well. So as I move forward to x86 workloads, um, and what we have to realize is that that means that everything has become virtualized. We're trying to get off of bare metal. We're trying to get off of assigning x86 directly onto computers as a complete replacement to existing hardware appliances. And towards that end, there's a number of pieces that have to be brought into this. And the goal is to take away the specialized uh, network interface cards or appliances that are necessary and, and eventually get this all the way into the cloud. To prove this out, a number of proof of concepts that, that we've put together, I just want to describe three. It takes me a little bit of time to get there. But one is uh, between, our, between Imagine and Cisco on being able to do IP-based cloud video uh, playout and distribution. Now, a bit of this, what we want to show and what we have proven in some of the challenges that we had when we originally were putting this together was in fact with a part of networking, and it was the virtual switch and virtual router that was running on the computers that had to get IP frames directly into the, into the application, the encoders and transcoders, et cetera. And the issue really becomes that the virtual switch and routers, OVS in particular, open, open virtual switch, couldn't handle the bandwidth. Now, the reason why this is interesting is that as we're looking at going into a containerized environment, as we, as we all know, application containers use the services of the host container, which is the Linux kernel. So solving, looking at these two problems of looking at a hypervisor-based approach or a container-based approach, we realized that we needed to do something with, about the networking piece of this. And that's something that we accomplished by um, open sourcing via the fastdata.io group and a particular technology that uses DPDK called VPP or vector packet processing. Uh, solved this problem. So in the end, what, what this, how we set this up was we've got some content that we want to be able to go through, and we've got two different flows, and I'll show this a couple different ways, going through uh, KVM-based as well as VMware for uh, high-speed playout of multiple flows on the other side. 
And really, the, the key piece here that I wanted to show is we were running into this situation, whether it's VMware or Open Virtual Switch, the number of flows you were putting onto the computer actually was causing artifacts during playout. And so we open sourced, again, uh, VPP and FIDO. And this has got all of Cisco's networking knowledge of how to have ex extremely high performance scaling and features available. And I'll show you that in a little bit. So the first example, and I've shown this actually in the booth a year ago, we took uh, a 1080p file and, and wanted to transcode it. And we were able to show by using uh, containerized encoders that we could take a two and a half hour job that was running on a hardware appliance, applying parallelism and accomplishing that in two and a half minutes. Well, what I'm going to show you is that we actually have it a uh, two, two hour movie transcoded in 10 seconds by using containerized microservices. And this is a key piece, because whether you're doing transcoding, quality control, or optimization, all of those are constant flows that need to go through the same system. The operational calendar required to handle that job now has fundamentally been changed. And so that virtualized uh, live media production, or this, sorry, the second example I want to show is an example in a partner of ours, uh, Karen Hego, of how we're able to do that as well uh, on x86 pieces. And really what we accomplished here was we realized that the way that many applications were expecting to receive the, the uh, bit stream and process it, of course, was line by line, which is the way we've done it for many, many years, if not decades or longer. But what we did is we modified how we did the forwarding and actually are doing everything, doing everything on a frame by frame basis and using very flexible and very large IP packets and actually moving frames and distributing full video frames within that system. And uh, that, that improvement in performance of the application allowed us with Karen Hego to actually have uh, a couple of examples I'm going to show you of being able to, to reprocess uh, the data itself as well as uh, apply logos, et cetera, floating through the system. So an overview just really, really quickly and using, using their technology as well was that we were able to bring in the, the, the SMPTV frame data and get it into their hypervisor and then uh, get it back out the other side. And although sounding relatively straightforward, this, this required quite a bit of work. And the second one was being able to ingest uh, 4K live, live uh, video itself and bring it out the other side in a fully virtualized environment. And that workflow overview as well, just quickly you can see the, the, the effectively software pipeline that was put in place was enabled because we were able to handle that, that high throughput as well as schedule and capacity plan within that cloud, how that was going to work. So taking a look at, at this itself, here's the first one where we're at, we took that entire 1080p file, attacked a data center effectively by firing up encoders and microservices, and 10 seconds later, the entire 1080p file was transcoded. And so that's you know, looking at a greater than 700% improvement over uh, the way it was done is incredible. So in this particular case, looking at a virtualized pipeline environment, Things work well until you start adding more and more load, and then the software virtualized pipeline begins to get clogged. And this was, again, due to that virtual switch and virtual router. And at the very end of this uh, film, you're going to see that, in fact, there's so many artifacts, the, the frames actually drop. The next piece was the, the last proof of concept that I showed you with the virtualized live media production in which we're able to show this, this pipeline in a fully, fully virtualized environment. And what becomes interesting is you get to get the complete statistics and analytics out of the system itself and understand how it's running uh, in the environment. And so this, this movement of not just bringing up uh, necessarily hypervisors and, and containers and making this work, but actually having a, a full stack or a complete stack to be able to see the analytics, have operational data out of that workflow, um, has been a lot of work in the industry. And so as you can see this here, uh, we're able to apply that and you get visibility into the, the full infrastructure that's there, starting and stopping multiple pipelines at that time, immediately expanding to use the x86 capability that's possible uh, in a data center, and, and then once again, having the full flexibility and understanding of those uh, 
of those pipelines, restarting here, starting, stopping, et cetera, and automatically orchestrating what's going on and seeing the differences uh, in the management displays. So as we move forward, let's move on to the next topic, which is bringing all of this to the cloud. And, and this event and looking at the holistic production all the way through um, play out and on the end hosts and the holistic view of security itself. And so these security challenges, needless to say, are worth immense amount of, of money into the, into the industry. And as you're reading here, you know, there's a few, few big numbers that you want to see. In particular, what we're seeing from our VDI data, that's a massive percentage of pirated streamed uh, traffic itself. And we all have come to the realization that you can't just put firewalls around this and consider this done. You can't just build another moat around streaming content. It's fundamentally impossible. So a moat around content is not going to solve all of these problems and is not going to solve the, the value loss that's occurring. So taking a look at this, and again, just continuing to put a few numbers of the types of breaches that we're seeing and talking about, not only is it customer trust, it's a massive amount of money. So the industry, as most folks are aware, put together recommendations of what should be uh, built into the media supply chain to be able to secure, uh, according to current variables, what we can possibly do. And just taking a look at the next one, and, and again, this was a, a PDF that's available. There's many, many basic pieces here of just how to run IT and operationalize this, the, the, the content or media that's being produced. A lot of these are regularly available now, but they're not actually a part of those systems. So when we look at the entire value chain and all the pieces, um, one thing that we put into place is that we, we've tried to build a completely holistic view all the way from acquisition, and again, looking at the same full, um, full piece that I started with, from acquisition all the way to the end point, we're trying to provide specific security solutions with a holistic architecture around it. And so towards that end, let me show you a, a few couple pieces. Needless to say, you, you'd like to be able to defend everything you can before something happens. You need to be able to detect it, and then you need to be able to solve this problem. And this technology is something that, that we just released, at least. And just stepping forward, really, <clears throat> A big piece of this and a big topic in the industry, of course, has been multi-DRM and being able to actually handle um, the consumer devices and the DRM technologies that are possible in multiple streamers with, with multi-DRM itself during playback. The next piece is to be able to detect and terminate piracy on streaming video as it's occurring uh, in the industry as well. And that's location, identification, of course, uh, and then eventually eliminating it. And with the, something that we're calling the Streaminator, actually the different steps are in place, but it requires a number of uh, pieces of technology to be built into the media itself to be able to, to create this type of environment. And as you can see, it's being able to identify it, locate it, and then eliminate it, and screens go black when somebody is pirating that, that, that particular piece. To be able to do this, we're actually using machine learning on the, on the actual use of the streaming data on the endpoints itself to be able to understand the different user profiles and then to be able to detect when something has been pirated and is outside those profiles. That use of machine learning in a cloud environment associated with that particular data is a critical piece of the industry. Yes, it sounds like another industry buzzword as many folks are trying to use this form of analytics to be able to determine uh, what's going on in a system, and for us, we've used it to be able to determine what streams have been stolen. In addition, uh, we have built into the media itself as part of this overall system, very, very deep watermarking, which again involves the endpoint and involves the, the player itself, and enables us to be able to detect again when content has been stolen. So, so towards this end, as we, as we look at trying to be proactive and continuing to have a holistic approach of this, the contextualization between the, the policy and the data access itself was a key piece in using uh, machine learning, protecting the data with watermarking, securing that asset in the cloud through the entire lifecycle, 
because as you move to the cloud, the intermediate results also need to be secured as well, of course. But, and, and what we've shown between, between our two companies is that it can be done without necessarily interrupting the, the current workflow creation of content itself, which becomes key. So as I, as I move forward and move towards cloud architectures, which have been discussed so much this week, there's a few things that I want to be able to discuss or have a conversation with you about, which is not only what's going on in the cloud, but also how the industry itself needs to evolve the talent and skills to be able to operate a cloud. Because that right now potentially could be the long pole in the industry for getting all of this done. So as you've re read this as I've been speaking, we've moved from appliances to bare metal to hypervisors into containers. And there's always a future for this stuff, including with unikernels going forward. Um, how can this industry um, enter into using all of these technologies similar to what I've shown already in a couple of proof of concepts. So to, to enable this transition or how companies uh, can make this transition, really it's, of course, making sure that partners like Cisco and Imagine can, get to, can work together and create the media workflows uninterrupted as it was in the past. Um, understand the, that full stacks are now production quality and production ready, and then the skills piece. And so towards that end, I'm, I'm just kind of drawing out here that, in fact, through the entire media creation and distribution uh, cycle, the use of both private data centers and private clouds, and then, of course, public clouds is on the rise, whether it's used for encoding or for distribution. It's so widely used in the industry. This means that necessarily the entire industry is trying to orchestrate a hybrid, a hybrid cloud environment, yet not get tied or locked into one specific cloud. So I'm going to take a quick tangent for a second. The magical public cloud by multiple suppliers, and I'll just use these for sake of conversation of Amazon, Azure, SoftLayer, Rackspace, on and on and on. There's a number of public cloud providers. Each of them have services they're providing and have a platform to program the applications to. And if you program your entire workload or workflow into that one public cloud, you effectively can get locked. It's very challenging to move these between uh, different cloud providers. And that's where this industry needs to go immediately to be able to utilize any of the resources geographically or with respect to compute, storage, and networking where they're available to be able to produce content or to be able to distribute it. So as I mentioned earlier, when you, when you think about that, that wheel that I originally started this conversation with, the last seven or so years of networking and compute has been around software-defined networking, network function virtualization, OpenStack, containers, et cetera, et cetera. What that would mean for a media engineer or uh, an operator in that environment, and what we've been through for seven years, is defining each and every one of the lines that connects all these different dots together from these different views. Often what's been talked about in the industry is that application developers, like a media engineer, should be a whole stack developer. What that means in some is that they would need to know how to program every layer and what's going on inside this orchestration system. There isn't, I'll round this to the nearest integer, there are zero people on the planet that currently can understand all of the APIs and, and quickly moving APIs that are necessary to be able to run this system. And the way we've worked with Imagine, and that's worked out really quite well, is we drew the line all the way at the top. Cisco will try and take care of everything below the line. That's what we do. We're an infrastructure company. And Imagine is a workflow orchestration company in this particular case in what we did together, because what they're trying to do is there's a source. We want to do some ad insertion. We want to do some encoding. And we want to distribute this data or this, this content. But for me, I need to be able to create connect the physical underlay to a virtual topology, create, create the services and capacity, and then create a policy that reflects that topology of the workloads that, create, that Imagine Xenium, in this case, has created on top. So as long as we understand our roles and the complexity of the industry, we can work in the media industry and enable the media industry to be a no-stack developer, that in fact they shouldn't need to know about any of the details below this line. 
I would like the intent of my workflow to be programmed into the, into the IP media data center. Please work it out for me. And so this has worked out really quite well for a, uh, our two companies working together. So in looking at acquisition and creation, I'm now t taking the conversation to talk about skills and roles. You just take a look at the role of, uh, uh, in, the, in the acquisition case, the expertise that's necessary for each of these and the responsibility, again, for sake of conversation. Let me put this into, we bring in the magical cloud. Here it arrives in. So what does this mean? We now have virtual machines running on site. We have bare metal running on site. We have the cloud running. Take a look at the number of roles and skills that become necessary to make this happen. And when we take a look at the, the three roles we had before, we had the solution developer now who's trying to build out the policy, DevOps, et cetera, et cetera. This means to build out that whole stack, lots and lots of new skills are necessary to be able to, to make this happen. Just to, again, all of these new roles are to build out that data center and to operate it. But what becomes interesting, and again, my point is, these, th those skill set and that, that talent and that experience is not core to any media production business. And that's why the no stack developer dealing with a fully orchestrated system becomes really, really critical or the industry will suddenly truck in a bunch of IT engineers just to, to run that uh, media data center. So as I move this and bring up another industry topic of the DevOps where you develop and operate at the same time, taking a look at how a vendor and a development team, QA, operations business, and how this overall business system flows, let me take a, let's take a look at this a little bit in detail. In particular, we'll take a look at the development team that development team, looking at being software engineers, integration, user experience, needs to have specific skill sets brought into them. Second, when taking a look at the quality assurance engineer, looking at whether it's test, automation, or infrastructure, those new roles have new skills that are necessary for them. And as we continue to move around the circle, we realize that coding, validating, analytics, specking, sending requirements, this DevOps cycle is now well within the vendors as a part of the media content production and working directly with those teams in a continuous fashion. And that's really what this, what this means. Taking a look at operations, there's now cloud engineers, assurance, infrastructure. Again, you take a look at these new roles for the new uh, jobs that emerge in trying to build out a cloud-based environment and it's very different than it was in the past. So the proposal here is, in that hybrid environment, have a cloud abstraction format, uh, platform that enables those hybrid workloads across multiple public clouds that are available, as well as an on-prem private data center. This is rapidly emerging as being an open source community of, of all those new roles that I discussed. You can take a look at big, uh, big data platforms, controllers, orchestration, whether OpenStack or containers, and creating new partnerships in the industry like we have with Imagine and Cisco and, and like we had multiple other uh, partners associated uh, to build that France Telecom proof of concept. So working towards wrapping up, hopefully the bit rate's been pretty good so far. It's been at a quick pace. To enable this media platform as a service layer, this whole piece comes back into play. And all of the action of producing and distributing media is above that blue line. And what, I, what we're trying to accomplish is basically everything below that blue line, such that when you create a media production workflow in something like Xenium, the, data, the media data center underneath can be immediately orchestrated underneath. And so my, my very last slide here, again, is getting to the economics point and where, how the industry has been transitioning towards all of these goals um, through the acquisition all the way to the end point. Uh, IP can uh, fulfill that position. And as the industry continues to emerge, it's a great sign that we're working together towards standardizing that highest layer of the platform and that the industry is working towards having the scale performance orchestration pieces that are necessary to get this done. So I thank you very much uh, for, for attending and listening, and I look to see you and have a great show. Thank you very much.